today. I told you I paid for it. Sir, relax. This is ridiculous. What do you need the receipt for? On an all-new Dr. Phil. We were falsely accused of stealing racial profiling. Pulled over for having done nothing wrong. White privilege. I can drive a nice car through a neighborhood and not get stopped. You can't. Microaggression. That's probably one of the most disrespectful statements I've heard in a long time. And more. All white people are now being portrayed as racist. It's not fair. I am certainly not going to apologize because some other bad white person did something to somebody. I'm not going to let the black community demonize my race. I think it's a matter of being open to just say, is there something I can learn? Today's going to be a changing day in your life. You've never had anybody working harder to bring you to the threshold of change than right now. There's no denying it. Our nation is in the middle of a political, cultural, and racial divide. And it's not theoretical. You can feel this. It's palpable. What do we want? Justice. What do we want? It? Protesters have taken to the streets across America, outraged over the death of George Floyd in police custody. From Minneapolis to Dallas and San Francisco to Atlanta, we've seen demands for justice and equality. <laughs> news is in Atlanta, Georgia, as racial tensions rise in the U.S. The latest CBS poll shows that racial tensions in the past year have increased. Treasurer Michael Furr said President Donald Trump's rhetoric has magnified racial tensions across the country. Being black in America should not be a death sentence. When you hear someone calling for help, you are supposed to help. The killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery were tipping points that caused many white Americans to consider tough questions about race that really have not been considered before. It has been reported that Google searches for the question, am I racist, have spiked in recent months to an all-time high. So we're going to talk about it today. The idea is to have difficult but respectful dialogue as a way for us all to not only look within ourselves, but also jumpstart the conversation with our family and friends. Now, I'm challenging us all to take a closer look at how we interact and treat black people as a group who have undeniably helped to build this nation from the ground up. It is no longer okay to sit on the sidelines and be neutral. But the good thing is there are many white people out there who want to understand and learn. Now, I want to be clear. This isn't a platform to put people on the defensive, but to show them where they may be looking through the wrong lens and how they might be able to help our society by being more aware. And let me be very clear about two important points, important to me. First, I don't talk politics on this show, and today is no exception. I talk about important psychological issues, social issues, and family issues. Second, I'm not here today to make anyone feel guilty about anything. I want us to have an open, intelligent, respectful discussion. And I predict no matter where you start in thinking and values, you're going to feel better at the end of today's discussion. But first, I have gathered a group of people willing to have this discussion comprised of white Americans who say they're not racist and black Americans who say they live with racism, implicit bias, and microaggressions on a daily basis due to the color of their skin. Now, my first guests are a black couple who say an encounter with a store manager went wrong and they suspect it had to do with their skin color. 
I told her I paid for that. A black family says they were followed out of a Nike store in Santa Monica by a manager accusing them of stealing a basketball, but they say they paid for it. I told you I paid for that. Dirt, relax. Last summer, my family was racially profiled at a Nike store. Joel was buying our son Samuel his first basketball. We left the store, and I heard a commotion. A white woman was approaching my husband, being all aggressive and in his face. I told you we bought it. What do you need the receipt for? What are you talking about? When I saw this woman, I thought to myself, what the hell is this white woman approaching this black man on the street? What does it say on there? Anytime a white woman gets into a conflict with a black man in public, it's not a good situation. Then she flagged down police officers. My reaction was, what is going on? I, don't, I have no clue what's going on. You guys want to tell me what's ridiculous. going on? Yeah. They walked up to him and said, give her that stolen ball. Joel rolled the ball across the street and threw the receipt. After showing the receipt, the officers gave us the basketball back. So now you come refund his money, and I want an apology. This is ridiculous. And it's profiling. I told told her I wanted to return that ball and that I wanted to speak with her manager immediately. Come to find out, the white woman was the manager. I posted that video, and there was about 500,000 views the next day. You knew better. I told you I paid for Back that. Up, babe. I was worried my husband would get tased or shot by these officers. I feel embarrassed. This situation is something that I went to therapy over. What that woman did to us could have ruined my reputation and harmed my career. I work with 99% white people across my career, and none of them ever had this happened to them. Growing up, I remember being called the N-word, and I was abused. I don't want that for my son. Well, thank you all for being here. Does this woman follow you out of the store uh, immediately? I, I mean, we're seeing her here. How far out of the store are you right here? A block. A block. A mile block. Okay. block. Were you surprised? I, I was Did you see her coming? Surprised, or? confused. I mean... Yeah. All, all the above. So, so your, let me answer your question. It, it, it's hard to relieve the moment, right? But to answer your question, did she follow us out immediately? She had her, she was lockstep, followed us right out of the door. And she started kind of aggressively coming towards Joel, saying something loudly to him and distracted him from walking with our son. And our son was walking, you know, without either one of us very close in the middle of the intersection. And um, it, it's not 10 feet from, from the store door, front door to the intersection. So it was, mm. it, was, it was dangerous. It put us in physical harm. I mean, it was very, it was and, sudden. And that's why I had to, I, I, I didn't realize what was going on, so I had to put my son down. And he actually started taking off why, you know, this lady is throwing out lies saying mm. I took a ball. When the police got there, what was the attitude that you got from them? They did a horrible job at serving and protecting us. You know, when the police officers came on scene, they pretty much, in their mind, already knew that we stole the ball. They didn't come to us asking us how our evening was. They pretty much acted out of hate because of the lie that she told that we stole the ball. When they approached, they, they didn't even say, you know, excuse me, sir, can I see that item? We need to ask you a question. They approached my husband and they said, give the, her the, the stolen, stolen ball. ball. In yeah. effect, they were stealing our property. Wow. She sicked those officers on us and told them that we stole a ball that we couldn't have stole because obviously I didn't steal it because I had a, a receipt for the right. ball. I feel like just lying to a police officer, you know, could have got us killed. That's true. You were actually sponsored by Nike for a long time, right? Yeah, I represented Team USA. I told my wife not to film this. I want to apologize to my wife. And later... This is the reason why we're in this situation in America, because people don't think black lives matter. I do think black you lives Let me matter. finish. I, did, I never interrupted you. We just told you we bought it. What do you need the receipt for? After the racial incident at the Nike store, there was no real response or change, and we're now suing Nike. We don't feel like our voices were being heard. Come to the table, talk to us, 
Hear us out. Let us know that you are with people of color. Help us change what's going on. This should never have gotten this far. This is embarrassing to have to be suing a company that you thought you loved. You were actually sponsored by Nike for a long time, right? Yeah, I represented Team USA in the 2008 uh, World Championships. So right. Nike was our uh, main sponsor. You will see me in a uniform with a Nike check, <laughs> yeah. which was my favorite you know, brand growing up. I wanted to be like Michael Jordan. Uh, that ball was really significant to me because that paid my way through college. Well, Nike responded to this on the 19th of July. They issued this apology. We are taking the recent situation at our Santa Monica store very seriously, and we're currently investigating the facts. We have reached out to the family to express our deepest apologies, and we will continue to work with our teams to ensure we deliver on our expectations for consumer experiences. They've made billions of dollars off of the backs of people that look like me, right? Billions. So what is your expectations? What are you planning to do to change the infrastructure of your company so people like me can feel safe? Read that police report. She told the police officer the guy in the pink sweater stole the ball. How can I steal something and I pay for it at the same time? And imagine, I told my wife not to film this because I knew that I will be on Dr. Phil one day. <laughs> you know what I mean? And the, the sad thing about it is I was mad at her in a moment, but this is the only thing that is exonerating us. And I want to apologize to my wife openly in front of the public, the world, whatever, and tell her I'm sorry for telling her don't film that because I was so embarrassed. And now I, I refuse to be embarrassed to fight for my freedom, you know, my justice for all for a country that I represented, a country that I won a gold medal for. I refuse to uh, sit dormant and not fight for people, people like um, George uh, Floyd that can't talk. Mm -hmm. You know, that could have easily happened to us. I have mm -hmm. a son, he has a daughter. I'm here to tell my story, right? The story of truth, mm -hmm. the story of uh, being discriminated against, the story of being hated for nothing. And, and the thing, Dr. Phil, that really hurts, you know, as a black man, I'm 37 years young. I've been called the N-word. I can't even count how many times. I don't care about myself. When I look at my son and say, wow, this, not even two years old, he has to deal with this, mm -hmm. right? My son has to deal with this. So I was like, no, I refuse not to fight. I refuse not to fight. I refuse not to ask a company like Nike to not to stand with me, just like how you stand with me when we won the gold medal for you. Yeah. I refuse not to, to just sit back and be a coward and not defend my freedom and justice because this is America, right? This is America. My grandfather fought for the country, you know, and couldn't even get a sandwich. He didn't get his freedom and justice for all. He had to go to the back and today, after winning a gold medal for this country. Guess what? I went to a the Nike store, right? I can't even go with my family and be treated right. You know, I'm falsely accused. This ain't something, I'm on here, we're on here because we were falsely accused. Yeah. I didn't steal nothing. Why are you following us? Why can I live in peace? Yeah. Why do I have to step outside and, and look be looked at as an angry, black man that was doing everything that I can do. I didn't want this. What do we look like going and stealing a $12 ball? We definitely don't look like it to us. It wasn't the, the content of our character. My wife, I, like I said, I apologize to her. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. I mean, good wives do what they know is right and not what their husbands you're, tell you're, them. You're not a good wife, you're a great <laughs> no wife. Argue, no argument here. All right. <laughs> We're going to take a break. We're going to meet a man who claims the Black Lives Matter movement is not a movement for change, but a war against white people. We'll also meet a leading race relations expert who says that racial microaggressions feel like death by a million paper cuts. We'll talk yeah. to those folks when we come back. My problem with Black Lives Matter is they are a terrorist hate group. Black Lives Matter is not a group. It is a movement.
Well, today I'm talking to guests, black and white, who have strong experiences and beliefs about racism. In particular, I'm asking white people to take a minute to really look within themselves to see how they might be able to help our society by being more aware of microaggressions and implicit bias. Now, joining me now are Dr. Sean Harper, professor and racial equality expert at the University of Southern California. He says racial microaggressions are like death by a million paper cuts to a person of color. Also joining me live from Laurel, Mississippi via Ionico is Jim Sigalski, a journalist who caused a stir earlier this year when he branded the Black Lives Matter movement, quote, the war against white people. And Dr. Harper, let's talk microaggressions so people know what we're talking about. Microaggression is a small act or remark that makes someone feel insulted or treated badly because of their race, sex, et cetera, even though the insult, et cetera, may not have been intended and that can combine with other similar acts or remarks over time to cause emotional harm. So it's not a big, gross, overt act. Um, and I think what happened here was beyond microaggression. But, Absolutely. And then implicit bias. Implicit bias refers to the attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions in an unconscious manner. So it's not something that people consciously select, but it's there. It's pre-conscious or unconscious, and it's a filter they look through. F fair? Absolutely. Both of those are accurate. One of the things that most people misunderstand about microaggressions, they think of them as just being so tiny. Wh why are you so offended by such a little thing? You got to get a thicker skin, many people will say, right? But what they don't understand is that it is the everydayness of racial microaggressions. If you get a paper cut, yeah, it stings, it's annoying, but just imagine all day long getting one paper cut after another. Eventually, you may bleed. Eventually, the wound may become infected. That's how racial microaggressions are experienced by black Americans and other people of color. Driving while black is another. Um, and the constant threat of being pulled over by a police officer for having done nothing wrong. Yeah. And here's a video that depicts the adverse impact that microaggressions have on black people. Now, this role play scenario is from Dr. Daryl Wing Sue, professor of psychology and education at Teachers College, Columbia University. Take a quick look. Microaggressions occur because they are outside the level of conscious awareness of the perpetrator. Microaggressions can also be delivered non-verbally through unconscious behaviors or gestures. In this scene, Jenny has finished a late night at the office and awaits the elevator. As the door opens, she takes one step forward, sees a black male rider, hesitates, and immediately clutches her purse and places her hand over her necklace. The hidden communication is that African Americans are prone to crime, will break the law, are up to no good, and will steal. Example, right? A firsthand lived example that I've had way too many times yeah. in my life. Yeah. Now, Jim is joining us. You think that Black Lives Matter is a different sort of thing than it's being characterized by in most of the media. Can I first start by saying, I know racism exists. It, it, it's not like I'm trying to deny racism, but racism is a human trait. It is, it is not a white person trait. My problem with Black Lives Matter is they are a, a, a terrorist hate group who actually has advocated for the murder of police officers. That's my problem with Black Lives Matter. Now, if somebody wants to protect black lives, that's one thing, but that group is actually a terrorist hate group, and they overtly have come out and said that they are for the murder of police officers. They've chanted it. Mm -hmm. Doctor? Black Lives Matter is not a group. It is a movement. Mm -hmm. It is a movement to help the world understand the effects of systemic and structural racism 
on black people, not just in 2020, not just in the 2000s, but really for centuries here in America. Black Lives Matter is not just the extremist examples. You know, it would be unfair and, you know, frankly dishonest of me to only pull extremist examples of white people doing very bad things to people of color here in America. Um, therefore, it is incredibly, I think, dishonest and just disrespectful to reduce Black Lives Matter to, you know, a handful of incidents of people who, you know, may in fact be, in fact, behaving in, you know, violent or inappropriate ways. But the movement is so much bigger than that. It's not a terrorist matter, organization. Bond. Black Lives Matter's leaders have chanted, pigs in a blanket, fry them like bacon. Black lives absolutely matter. It's the group that's the problem. The fact that white people, all white people, are now being portrayed as racists is a big problem in my book. It's not fair. It's, that's a racist generalization to begin with. If you think all white people are racist, you are, in fact, the racist. Black Lives Matter is very much like the KKK because they advocate hate and they advocate so, violence against people. So, that is white. a really bad comparison. Yes. I think it is absolutely absurd. It and is. I think you can cherry pick certain statements from individuals and try to paint an entire movement with it. And that is, the the, that is simply not the case. We have to take a break. We're going to meet a black woman who says she was interrogated by the police on suspicion of trespassing in a hotel. She has something to say to her accuser next. tell you I have a key to get it and I don't have to tell you what my man we were the only black family at the pool she said I'm tired of you people coming here using the pool my son is only 11 years old she thought the cops was gonna shoot me We're talking today about racism and the pernicious subtle ways it can be expressed resulting in a black person feeling alienated, targeted, and inferior. Now, my next guest says her experience with a microaggression left her furious and really her children terrified. I have a room here and I told her that. What's your name? So she called you, officer, and she called you here. So y'all both here harassing me. A situation involving a hotel employee, two Williamson police officers, and a hotel guest. The day that this happened, me and my two kids had went to the pool at the Hampton Inn. While my kids were in the pool, I stepped away to make an important phone call. I saw a lady and I said, hello. And then I asked her, was everything okay? I don't have to tell you, I have a key to get it. Why do you need to know what room I'm in? We were the only black family at the pool. Two white people sitting over there, she said nothing to them. She said, I'm tired of you people coming here using the pool and it's not authorized. I said, because I know you're not talking about black people. She said, well, you people keep coming here and you're not a guest at this hotel. She didn't identify herself as an employee. My room, where's my proof? This is my proof, okay? This is my proof. So I don't, why do I have to tell you what room I'm in? I showed them the key and I said, Here's my key. I, I could prove that it worked. I decided to turn on my phone to film me and the police because I felt like I was in danger. Run her license plate. You can do whatever you want. And they're running my license plate. I'm here on business with my kids in the pool. At that moment, I was in shock. I was like, it's just really happening. I yes. felt like I was being interrogated by the police. My son is only 11 years old. She thought the cops was going to shoot me. What makes her think that I couldn't afford to be at that hotel? What I want white people to know is to look at us as equal. I'm adding to the conversation Anita, joining from North Carolina via Ionico, and my good friend, her attorney, Benjamin Crump, a well-known civil rights lawyer and author of best-selling book, Open Season, Legalized Genocide of Colored People. Welcome to both of you. Uh, Nita, good to meet you. Ben, how you doing? Nice to meet you. Hanging in there, Dr. Phil. Thank you for having this important conversation for America. 
Anita, I'm glad you turned your phone on at the pool. What was your first thought when you were approached? I didn't even know she was an employee of the Hampton Inn Hotel. The police were called, so they started demanding identification. They ran your license plate. How did this ultimately end? We don't see that in the video. What me telling my son and daughter to come out the pool and we were just going to go back to our room. And were you followed going to your room? Yes, she followed me to the elevator. Um, in the video, you can hear her um, threatening that the manager was going to come to the room. And she was saying a whole bunch of stuff. I, I had, at that point, I tuned her out because I was just thinking about my kids, that they had to experience this. And my son, he had his, his head, his, like his chin all the way in his chest, his head down. He wouldn't pick his head up at all. So I just looked at my son. And I was like, oh, he's like, he's terrified. Ben, what do you make of this? Dr. Phil, I think far too often you see these microaggressions as your uh, panelists have articulated that they lead to action. We see on a larger level this implicit bias leads to policies and then uh, municipal ordinance. They lead to federal regulations and then they lead to things where you see a justification of unjustifiable acts like uh, Eric Gardner being choked, saying, I can't breathe in New York, or George Floyd having a knee on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. But you have laws that would say, well, they were following policies and procedures, and so they argue that that was justified. That's what we're fighting against. So what happens with this hotel that changes this policy? Will, what will have to happen? Well, it's quite obvious if you don't respect black women, if you don't expect black business and our black families, then the Hilton should not expect our black dollars. Because if you're going to discriminate against us, then we have to, as a uh, community, say that we won't tolerate that kind of activity. Anita's son thought the police were going to kill his mother because they were prejudged by an employee who needed better training from the corporation. Here's an excerpt from a statement of apology from Hampton by Hilton. It says, we have apologized directly to the guest and her family for the experience and will work with them and the hotel to make this right. We remain in contact with the hotel's ownership about follow-up actions and to ensure that in the future, their employees reflect the best values of our brand and are welcoming for all. I don't know who the Hampton apologized to, but it wasn't me. Hey. I don't know every, what they wrote in that statement. Um, that was really nice to write, but they didn't apologize to my children. Anita, how are they going to make it right for our children? But let me say this. The system is working well for them, so they don't feel like they need to fix it. So that's why we have Black Lives Matter. To compare it to the the KKK, you, that's probably one of the most disrespectful and unhuman statements I've heard in a long time. And I've only been living on I, this I earth for 37 years. it's disrespectful to actually call for the murder let of Let me finish. Officer. Did I really interrupt you? Families, sir, sir, let me finish. See, this, this, is the, this, this, is, this is part of the reason. You, you can't, you don't, that's, you're very disrespectful. You don't ever, when, a, when someone else is talking, you need to listen. And this is, this is the reason why we're in this situation in America, because people don't think black lives matter. I do think black you, lives matter. Let me matters. finish. I, did, I never interrupted you. Don't do that. Go ahead, finish. Don't do it. Stop. The KKK has rippled the uh, black community for years and years and years. Centuries. And, and this man has the audacity to say something like that. That shows me your ignorance. My next guest says they feel strongly about the question are all white people racist? They'll reveal why when they join us next. I'm talking today about systemic racism and how this informs the experience of the average black and white American. Joining me in studio is Sydney from Los Angeles. She says she's a white ally who is sick and tired of seeing black people murdered for merely existing. And Katie joins us from Texas. 
She says she's a Republican YouTuber and founder of political and comedy website, The Good Patriot. She went viral last month when she posted a video entitled, Why We Should Never Apologize for Our Race. Hi America, I'm Good Patriot and I'm a racist piece of trash. I'm so racist that I don't even know how racist I am, or at least that's what I've been told. So to destroy racism, which apparently only exists against black people, I'm gonna have to do a few things. Number one, put a black box on my social media pages. This will ensure that I start working off my penance for being born white. And number two, I need to validate the existence of black people by saying the magic words, black lives matter. There you go. Racism has been annihilated. Have you ever heard of the Barbary slave trade? That's the one where for hundreds of years, millions of white Europeans were kidnapped and enslaved in North Africa. Kind of weird that we uh, never hear or talk about that example of slavery, right? Okay, interesting point of view. Sydney, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Uh, you've been listening to everything we've been talking about I so have. far. What did you want to add? I just want to apologize to both of all of you for the injustices and blatant bias discriminations that you faced. Um, I don't understand, and I never will, but I do understand that my life, being the way I am, being the color I am from the family I come from, will never be hard in the same ways as your life will always be hard if we don't start to actually address and sit down and have these uncomfortable conversations with the people closest to us and the ones that we don't want to have the conversations with. Um, I believe that each white person has to take accountability and acknowledge the fact that racism is part of our cultural past. Katie, what did you want to say? Hi, Dr. Phil. Uh, well, I'm here just to represent the people that are sick and tired of being called racist when we're not racist. My skin is not a shield against hardship. It's just an absence of melanin. And I made the video I did because I was frustrated, because I was sick and tired of having people tell me that not only was I outwardly racist, which I'm not, but I was also subconsciously racist. And I am very sorry for each individual situation where a person of color or a white person was discriminated against. It's, it's wrong and I condemn it, but I am not responsible for that. And they don't represent all people and bad things happen to all races. Let's talk about that for a minute. White families control 90% of the wealth in America, blacks 2.6%. White families earn $100, black families earn $57.30. Uh, black unemployment rate is double that of whites. Black college grads are two times as likely to be unemployed. Job applicants with white sounding names are called back 50% more than those with black sounding names. Black drivers are 30% more likely to be pulled over. Blacks infected with COVID-19, three times more likely than whites. The number one predictor of graduation is if a child is reading on grade level in the third grade. If not, they're four times less likely to graduate. If it's low income, they're six times less likely. And that is uh, overpopulated, overrepresented in the, the black community. 18% of preschoolers are black, but 50% of the suspensions are black. Black students are three times more likely to be suspended, even with similar infractions as their white classmates. 13% of the US population is black, but 40% of the prison population is black. And black home ownership is 42%. For whites, it is 72%. It's hard to say there's not a systemic issue in America. I can go to the store and not get followed. I can drive a nice car through a neighborhood and not get stopped. You can't. When I do get stopped, it's not the five most dangerous minutes of my life, yeah. and it might be yours. That's yeah. right. Next, a white woman who believes that white people should acknowledge their privilege and take action.
Three years ago on this stage, I conducted an experiment with a group of people from various walks of life to see how marginalized groups fared in life compared to white Americans. If you have ever tried to change your speech or mannerisms to gain credibility, if you can go anywhere in the country and easily find the kinds of hair products you need that match your skin color, if you would never think twice about calling the police when trouble occurs, take one step forward. If you have ever been the only person of your race, gender, in a classroom or workplace setting, if you have ever felt like there was not adequate or accurate representation of your racial group, looking at the people behind you, it just makes you think about why people don't get the opportunities that I do. If you were ever uncomfortable about a joke you overheard related to your race, ethnicity, gender, take one step back. I'm very aware of my white privilege, but it really showed through when I looked behind me and most of the people in the very back were people of color. It felt like those who were in the front were more comfortable. There was one female behind me. It felt like being a woman possibly come on with an extra challenge. I was in the back. I'm not ever in the back of anything that I do. It's a very sensitive topic. You don't want to offend anyone, but it's true. There are racial and social disparities in America, and these issues need to be talked about. Interesting experiment. Uh, also joining us uh, via Ionico is Hannah, who believes that white people should acknowledge their privilege. Hannah, what, do you, what would you like to add to this conversation? I just want to say I'm really sorry for what happened to you guys um, because that's a terrible thing and that those statistics you just showed right like they paint a very clear factual picture of the world we live in and there's basically you know two ways you can deal with it there's one explanation which uh, you started to hear Katie say a little bit of right which is that like all of these problems uh, have some root that is in the black community right um, there's a lot of different thing versions of it but they all boil down to there's something wrong with black people. That doesn't make any sense to me. Um, that's a, that's a, you know, people are people, we're good, we're bad. And, you know, the reality is when you have a system that is that, where there's that much disparity, the problem is in the system and it's in all of us. Um, and especially in white people, but certainly, you know, we are all part of the system. You know, I'm sorry that some white people are jerks and I'm sorry that some black people are jerks. Every race has a bad apples in there. But I am certainly not going to apologize because some other bad white person did something to somebody. And I'm not gonna let the black community or Black Lives Matter or anyone else demonize my race. I'm not racist and my life shows that. Yeah, and I, I think it's a matter of being open to just say, is there something I can learn. You know, there are common excuses to deny racism. Uh, the most common are, I have a black friend. I voted for Barack Obama. I don't have a racist bone in my body. I'm not a racist because I'm 2% black. I don't see race. Uh, I don't have white privilege because I'm poor. Not all white people are racist. You know, metacommunications are outside the conscious awareness, but they're buried in our interactions, and we need to be thoughtful about that. And the only way to combat that is through conscious vigilance. You gotta have a diversity of experience. I mean, find out what you don't know. Get outside your circle. Have a diversity of friends, and have a non-defensive attitude, an open discussion, and be an active ally, which Sydney is, has been such a great example of. I want to thank all of my guests today, including Dr. Sean Harper, USC Professor for Racial Equity. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, for more information about today's show, log on to drphil.com. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and don't forget, uh, to subscribe to Robin's podcast, I've Got a Secret. We will see you next time. Thanks so much.
in here, yeah mm -hmm. I thought that I could fly Woke up on the asphalt I swear there was the last time mm -hmm. I've always been naive Call it Yeah.